also using their functional and technical metadata terminology. We're doing this because one, it will help ground this presentation, and two, it's now an intrinsic part of our One Data for Insurance solution, which I will be discussing toward the later part of the hour. But to be clear, we need to view the use of external standard as an essential part of the overall picture of the enterprise data integration, as one of the four components in addition to master data, reference data, and metadata. Firstly, the business metadata layer, whose components include business terminology, business elements and models, which are system independent, and business rules and processes. Define your terms and maintain your definitions. Avoid definition creep. In the example here, we have a defined terminology of usage, which is fine. In fact, that comes from the Accord standard. But term definitions, bear in mind, are a moving target. We must anticipate them evolving. If you look at these two additional and enriched Accord definitions, the first definition now seems more vague, more generic. The goal is to make the definition as precise and as inclusive as possible. So in this simple example, these New York Times definitions would seem difficult to argue with. Accounts payable, money owed to supplier, accounts receivable, money owed by customers, unless of course you determine that the definition is not necessarily applicable to a particular industry. Accord, for example, provides a standard insurance definition around customer, but while supplier may be relevant to manufacturers, it doesn't appear in Accord as it's not relevant to the insurance industry nomenclature. On the other hand, producers, distributors, and the more generic business getters are indeed standard terms. Once we've accomplished due diligence with our business metadata terminology, we create our data model. Philosophically and in practice, we're very keen on reusability. So this first model to the left is not recommended as attribute is one to one and not one to many. The model should be flexible enough to enable reuse in other systems and adaptation to new standards. Consequently, we definitely favor model two, which says you begin modeling with atomic elements. We're also a proponent of creating metadata registries of atomic elements through standards such as ISO 11179. The business metadata layer has to be supported by business rules. Front-end rules governing basic data entry and Boolean logic, as well as back-end and systematic MDM type rules that govern data consolidation and enrichment. You need both if you consider that different rules may apply to different systems for purportedly the same attributes, like uh, an insurance providing uh, simple rules about how to handle addresses in their claims and invoicing systems. That's where the MDM concept of survivorship is critical, which allows you to impose consolidation rules overriding input, for example, from your claim system by designating invoicing as the best source for address. Additionally, the business metadata layer, we believe, is best supported by a number of processes written in clear business language and ideally stored in a central repository, such as governance and data quality processes, system application implementation processes, creation and change management process, data integration and harmonization process, data lineage or ETL processes for data warehousing and reporting environment. Business domains or code sets are sometimes considered part of metadata and sometimes part of reference data, so we'll be considering that in more detail momentarily. Metadata always has two sides those being the existing technical metadata assets and the business standard layer. Having one without linking it to the other is not very useful. For example, we can build a phenomenal technical metadata repository with metadata from dictionaries, ETL tools, BI tools, and make it visible. That's great. But if a new system is deployed, what then is the standard metadata definitions and representations? On the other hand, 
We can build an exceptional standard layer that has all the definitions and rules built in with the ideal business needs in mind. If the current systems don't comply then, we make it a paper standard. Having both metadata sides also means that we can either build the standard, validate against current metadata, and modify or use the current technical assets to build the standard layer straw man and then start fine tuning. But for a few moments, I'd like to bring this discussion back to tool enablement because creation of a metadata standard is very much dependent on the existence of a holistic metadata matching and cleansing engine. Our product, MetaMap, the one data solution for metadata analysis, discovery, and standardization, utilizes the Netrix matching engine. And to tell you more about Netrix, I'd like to introduce Dave Chamberlain of Netrix. Dave? Thanks, Charlie, and good morning, everybody. This is Dave Chamberlain from Netrix, and I'm happy to spend the next couple of minutes reviewing the Netrix matching engine with you which, as you know, is included in the Data Foundation's One Data product. So, in essence, the difference of our approach is that we use advanced mathematics to solve really tough matching problems. And we've divided the world of matching into two areas. The first is data matching, and that really is to do with how similar data elements or sets of data elements are one to the other. How similar is last name to last name, street address to street address, and so on. There are numerous conventional approaches to this. Some techniques or algorithms that you may have heard of, like SoundX, Nysys, Edit String Distance, Metaphone, and so on. And so on. They all suffer from this, a similar set of problems, and that is generally they lack accuracy. Some of them were designed to match people's last names and just about else. The difference in our approach, this mathematical model, that really is the human perception and calculation of similarity. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is then trying to decide if two records actually represent the same entity, whatever type of entity that may be. Conventionally, you basically, whether it's deterministic or probabilistic, build a complex set of rules and then try and figure out when you don't get the results that you're expecting, how you have to tweak those rules. The difference in our approach is that we have built uh, a machine learning trained mathematical model of how your human decision makers, how your human experts actually go about deciding whether two records represent the same person, the same business, the same transaction, or whatever it may be. So, if we move to the right-hand side, the advantages of this approach really come down to two major areas. The first is the accuracy with which we can determine how similar either data elements and or data records are to each other. The use of a mathematical model really gives us independence from the underlying data. We don't really understand or know or have any knowledge about what the underlying data represents. Often it's about people, people as customers, people as patients, and so on, uh, TV programs, stock trade, companies, claims, and transactions, and so on. It makes no difference to us. We're able to, with the same high accuracy, match just about any type of structured data and, and do it in a way that is independent of the language. So that represents the first piece of our strategy, to enable very accurate matching for any type of data in any language. The second piece is to make sure that the engine is easy to embed in any application, process, system, or tool that requires this type of matching, as in the one data product, and that we operate in a way that is independent of, yet linked to, the underlying database management system. Now let's look at a case study. This is to do with a major Californian agency who a couple of years ago performed a matching platform evaluation and implementation. They basically